This is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study of God's Word this morning, let's have a few moments of prayer to ask the Lord's guidance and direction on our time in His Word this morning. Father, we are so thankful that You have revealed Yourself to us in this way, that of all the ways in which You could have revealed Yourself to us, we know that this is the best way, because in Your omniscience You would know all of the options, and so You have recognized that this is the best way to communicate eternal truth to us, and that by studying your word, we come to understand who you are. We come to understand who we are and the problems that beset the human race in terms of our relationship to you and how uh, the sin problem is taken care of by Jesus Christ on the cross. But the spiritual life only begins at the cross, and it continues by our study of your word. As our Lord prayed the night before he went to the cross, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. It is only as we know and assimilate your word into our lives and into our thinking so that we think as you think and we can evaluate the issues of life is on the basis of your word that we can experience true uh, liberty, freedom in Christ and that we can truly understand uh, the issues of life and thus make wise decisions. So, Father, we pray this morning that as we study your word, that you would make clear to us the principles that are embedded within this chapter, and that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with these truths. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in 2 Kings chapter 2 this morning, 2 Kings chapter 2, and in this passage this morning, what we're going to see is the transition of prophetic power that goes from Elijah, who has been the major prophet in the northern kingdom up to this point, probably for some 30 years or perhaps longer, to a younger man, Elisha. Their names are similar. Some people might uh, get them confused. But the transition will go from Elijah to Elisha. And there are some unusual events that take place in this uh, chapter as well, as we will see in the coming chapters, because the ministry that God had, especially through Elisha, really expands that which he had through Elijah. And Elijah, we saw a number of extremely powerful miracles, but we will see even more, perhaps double the amount of uh, miracles in the ministry of Elisha. And it seems rather odd and bizarre at times, so I think this is an important uh, study for us because we can come to understand certain aspects of God's plan and purposes uh, in human history that we might not perceive otherwise as we go through uh, this particular uh, period in Israel's history. But what is highlighted in chapter 2 is not the miracles, but the character of Elisha. And that is important because too often people become distracted by the miracles of God in the Scripture, by the uh, miraculous gifts in the church age, and they forget that the real issue in the spiritual life is character transformation, the transformation of our character as fallen sinners, that once we are regenerated, once we become new creatures in Christ, once we are saved, then there is to be a character transformation that comes through the study of the Word of God under the teaching ministry of the Spirit of God so that we become conformed to the image of God in Christ. That is the focal point. That's what's described as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, 21 and following, 
those character qualities are the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in every one of our lives to transform us into that character. That means that if you are uh, interested in your spiritual life and spiritual growth and you are uh, positive to the Word, then you will, in some sense, be cooperating with God the Holy Spirit in terms of His achieving the mission that God the Father gave Him, which is to transform you into uh, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are just a lukewarm uh, believer, you're just sort of a casual Sunday-only uh, Christian, and the Word of God is not the primary focal point of your life, then you are going to be at loggerheads with God the Holy Spirit, and that's just going to mean that your life is never going to be what you think it should be, and you will be plagued by one problem after another, both externally and in terms of the uh, unsettled unhappiness of your own soul. Because God the Holy Spirit's mission is to uh, conform you to the character of Christ, and if your objective is to con keep yourself conformed to the world system around you, then you're constantly going to be uh, fighting what God the Holy Spirit is trying to do, and that's never a pleasant thing to experience in life. So when we come to look at this chapter, we're going to see some of, this, some of these characteristics, some of these character qualities uh, emphasized in the character of Elisha. And these qualities mark him as a successful believer. Now, not success as the world counts success in terms of numbers or in terms of popularity or in terms of uh, financial uh, success, but in terms of his ministry to, in, 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 for God, God's definition of success, which is that we are to be faithful and obedient. Now, the character qualities that I am summarizing here, I'm going to summarize under four terms, and these terms are synonymous. They overlap. There are slight differences in each of these words, but they do define a, an important dimension of anyone who is going to be a success in the spiritual life. So we're going to look at these four character words to describe our spiritual life, which are emphasized in the life of Elisha. So we'll look at this first, and then we will get into the text. The first word is perseverance. Perseverance, which I am using here to mean that we are to press on in spiritual growth in spite of difficulties or discouragement, adversity, or prosperity. In the New Testament, especially in the epistle of James and in the 12th chapter of Hebrews, this is marked out by a Greek word, hupomene, which means to endure. It means to uh, stay under, literally, if you just broke the word down into its components. And that's the idea of staying under the pressure, staying in the pressure cooker of difficulty, opposition, whatever, and consistently applying uh, the Word of God, and it is in those times that we grow and that we learn about the faithfulness of God. Second word is persistence. Persistence is very close to perseverance, and I'm using it to emphasize the idea of continuing doggedly or obstinately, or shall I even say being spiritually stubborn that no matter what difficulties you face, what oppositions may come, or what failures you encounter, you're not going to let any of that deter you from your primary mission in life, which is to be conformed to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, to study God's Word, to let God the Holy Spirit have the tools He needs in order to work in your life and in your soul and to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. This means that you must be spiritually tenacious. You must be spiritually tenacious. That means you're unwilling to let go. You're unwilling to give up. You're not going to let the fact that, uh, that life is getting tough, that you're overloaded at work, that you're overloaded at home, that there are pressures that come to you through the uh, cosmic system, the world system around us, 
that constantly seek to distract us from the focus of spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So you're going to hold on firmly to those spiritual priorities. You know what's right, and you know where you ought to be, what you ought to be doing every day to some degree. Sometimes you may have an hour every day that you can give to listening to a tape or listening to a recorded message, listening to uh, the Word being taught. Sometimes you only have 15 minutes, and you can catch that in your car on the way to work, on the way home. Sometimes you just have those short increments, a little bit in the morning, a little bit in the evening, but you recognize that there always has to be something, no matter what else is going on in life. Otherwise, it's too easy to be derailed, and the next thing we know, we wake up in carnality and under divine discipline. And then the last word would be spiritually aggressive. Spiritually aggressive. And we really see all of these in Elisha's attitude and the way he uh, is handling himself in this chapter. In spiritual aggression, I'm emphasizing this word zeal. Now that sometimes has a negative connotation. That just comes from you know, the, the world system that always wants to make a someone who's totally committed to the Word of God, they're just, they, they want to call them zealous, or they're some sort of a fanatic. And yet, in terms of what those words really mean, that's what we're supposed to be, completely, totally sold out, dedicated to God's mission for our lives. And so under this category, I'm talking about showing a tremendous energy and enthusiasm for learning the Word of God, applying the Word of God in our spiritual life, and growing to spiritual maturity. Now, all of these are seen in Elisha in this particular chapter. All right, let's go to verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 for our uh, introduction. This is at the end of Elijah's life, at the end of his ministry, and we read, It came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, and the, the Hebrew word for whirlwind, we think of something more cyclonic like a tornado or something of that nature, but it's just a storm. And it is a, you picture a, good spring thunderstorm on the plains of Texas and with all of the lightning and thunder and thunder clouds and and the ominous uh, rain and wind and everything that comes with that. And that's the idea that is presented in this word. And we must understand this in the backdrop of the entire ministry of both Elijah and Elisha because they are dealing with the enemy Uh, attack on Israel through the uh, perverted fertility religion of Baal and the and the Asherah. And Baal was the god, he was the storm god. He was the god of lightning, he's the god of rain, he's the god of fertility, prosperity, success, all of those things. And here we have this uh, tremendous image of God coming in the storm. He is the one. It is Yahweh, the God of Israel, that is the one who uh, rides the storm, that controls the storm, and that utilizes all of the forces of nature for his purposes, unlike the uh, view, the ultimate chaotic view that would underlie the, the pagan view that ultimately behind all the gods and goddesses there was this primordial uh, chaos, not unlike the pure chance, uh, pure time and chance view of, uh, that lies behind uh, evolution and evolutionary uh, cosmology. So here we have this picture of God coming. He's going to take up Elijah to heaven. He's not going to be transferred to heaven in a normal way uh, by means of just physical death. He's not going to die physically. He is going to be directly transferred from earth to heaven by means of this storm. And so we read in verse 2 that there is a preparation that Elijah is going to take uh, toward the one that God has already designated as his successor, and that is Elisha. Now, one thing we ought to note here just by way of observation and principle is that even though Elijah knows 
what God's will is and that Elisha is God's intended successor to Elijah, that doesn't absolve him of responsibility for training and challenging Elisha to the task, as if he didn't know what God's will was. And Elisha also knows that it is God's will to transfer the responsibility and the ministry of Elijah to himself, but that doesn't give him the right to just say, well, this is God's will, so I'm just going to sit back and let it happen. There is no passivity in either one of them towards the will of God. They don't use the sovereignty of God as an excuse for irresponsibility in terms of carrying out the spiritual life and their uh, their respective ministries. So in verse 2, we see uh, the first of a series of three motivational tests, we might say, from Elijah toward Elisha. He says to him, at the end of verse 1, we say that, that uh, Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And um, we need to make a note of these three places that are going to be involved in this in this journey from Gilgal to Bethel and then from Bethel to Jericho. So that means we need to take a look at a map in order to understand their respective locations. Now when we come to this first place, Gilgal, we run into a little bit of a challenge, just like uh, in places in in the United States, you often run into similar uh, names for cities. And so there's actually about four places that have been identified in ancient Israel with the name of Gilgal. The one that most people think of is the location that is just to the uh, east of Jericho. Jericho is down there. That's the red circle in the lower right. And Jericho is only about 15 miles or so from the Jordan River. This was, of course, the first place that the uh, Israelites conquered when they came into the land after the Exodus. But before they, uh, before they attacked Jericho, they met at Gilgal, and it was there that this, the uh, conquest generation, now that their, their, their fathers had all passed away, the previous generation, had all died off under divine discipline in the, in, in the wilderness because of their unwillingness to trust God at uh, Kadesh Barnea when they first sent the spies into the land and they came back and said, oh, it's too tough. We can't really conquer the Canaanites. There's too many of them. They're, they have fortified cities and there's giants in the land. And God said, and only Joshua and Caleb were willing to trust God for the victory, the conquest over the Canaanites. And so the discipline for the nation was that no one other than Joshua and Caleb would be allowed to enter into the promised land. So once that generation died off and God brought them into the land and they crossed the Jordan, they came close to Jericho, just about a mile or two away. And there they met and they had what must have been a rather uh, bizarre scene because remember there's about um, there's about 600,000 or so uh, males of fighting age, mature age, now in this new generation. And it was at Gilgal that they had to have this massive circumcision project because none of those who had been born in the wilderness, none of the males born in the wilderness had been circumcised. And circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And so this was to be a reminder that God had given this land to them and they were to be set apart as a distinct people from those around them. So before they could enter into the uh, warfare, the physical warfare, to take uh, the land from the Canaanites and to conquer them, they had to be spiritually prepared. And in that case, that meant that there had to be this physical uh, tr- a- action that took place in terms of circumcision. And this was a sign that they were now set apart, spiritually set apart for uh, the conquest. And so that is the background there. And that's why most people think, and if you read most commentaries or look in your study Bible, it probably takes this to be 
uh, that Gilgal. The problem with that is that if this is the Gilgal down by Jericho, then uh, Elijah's uh, uh, journey would go from next to Jericho over to Bethel and then back to Jericho and then across the Jordan, which is a rather odd or unusual way uh, of, of journey. However, there was a, another uh, Jericho, I mean another Gilgal, and um, Joshua 8, uh, 30 to 35 Joshua 8, 30 to 35, there is a mention that after the conquest of Jericho, after the conquest of Ai, so they went from Jericho west to Ai. Ai is just about three or four miles from Beth-el to the west. So they went from, the, in the conquest, they first defeated at Jericho, then they went to Ai, then Beth-el. And then we're told in Joshua eight thirty through 35, that Joshua took the Israelite army north from uh, Bethel to the area around Shechem, where I have that northernmost circle. And just outside of Shechem, you have two mountains, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And they had a ceremony uh, on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim that began with Joshua taking 12 uncut stones, represent the 12 representing the Israelites, the fact that they were uncut stones, they had not been touched by human hand, and what that meant was that no human works were involved in building this altar, no human works are involved in salvation, salvation is completely accomplished by God, and so they took these, un, these uh, uncut stones and built, he constructed an altar, and on that altar, he offered burnt offerings uh, for the nation. Then he wrote, or had chiseled upon those stones, a copy of the Law of Moses. Now that must have taken a little time, but he had a number of people to work on the project at one time. So they are uh, <clears throat> making a monument here for the memory of the nation to the covenant that God had made with Moses. And then he divided the nation into two groups. And on the Mount Ebal side, he set half the nation. And on the Mount Gerizim side, he set the other half of the nation. And they recited the law and recited their commitment as a nation to obedience to the law of Moses, which was the constitution of the nation. So this was an impressive ceremony. Now, if you take a look at that <clears throat> particular verse in Joshua eight thirty to 35, well, you see that it states that he did this just as Moses commanded him. And then if you go to Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine to 32, you'll see the original instruction. And in Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine, we read, Now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. What they had done in the recitation of the law was one side recited the blessings uh, for obedience and the other side recited the cursings for disobedience. And that chapter goes on to say in verse 30, are they not on the other side of the Jordan? Now, when Moses is giving this message, and Deuteronomy was basically a sermon to the people, his parting words, when he's speaking to them, he is on the opposite side of the Jordan. He's over on the east side of the Jordan. So when he says that this, this uh, location is going to be on the other side of the Jordan, he's talking about uh, the, the west side, and it's in the area that we now refer to as the West Bank. He says, Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal by the oak trees of Moreh? Uh, now we have to do a little more investigation because this identifies a Gilgal that is significant for this covenant renewal ceremony by the oak trees of Moreh. And we do a little investigation on the oak trees of Moriah. And what you discover is that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, when Abram and Sarai first came into the promised land, as he entered from the, 
from what would be the north, the top of the map, comes down from the north as he's traveled over from uh, Haran, over in the area that is now uh, Syria. He traveled down the center of uh, the promised land, and the first place that he stopped was at a place that is identified as Shechem, as far as the oak tree of Morah. That's what it is. Th- this identifies the location here that the oak tree of Morah, which is where Gilgal is located, is just there at Shechem. And this was where God promised to Abraham, reiterated to him in Genesis 12, 7, the land promise, where God said, and I will give to you and your descendants all of this land. So when we stop now and think about the significance of Gilgal, in this journey of Elijah, it is not just that, uh, that the writer of Scripture is saying, oh, this is a little travelogue. Uh, they, they drove from Houston to Dallas and went by way of Huntsville and Madisonville and Centerville. He names these places because there is a spiritual significance to these locations. He's not just going there because they're on the way. He's going there and he's stopping and making these statements to Elijah at these points because he is connect I mean to Elisha at this point because he is connecting Elisha's ministry for God to the Abrahamic covenant and to that land promise. And so the first place they they go is to this um <clears throat> to the location at Gilgal, which is there at Mount Ebal and Gerizim, where the nation had uh, recommitted itself to the Mosaic Law and where Abraham, Abram, had, had first built an altar to sacrifice to God when he came into the land and where God first clearly stated that this was the land that he was giving to Abram and his descendants. And so when we Look at verse 2. We read, Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. So he's testing Elisha. Uh, Do you have what it takes to continue the journey, or are you just going to stop here and and rest and uh, comfort yourselves and stay inside your your comfort zone? But Elisha said in the second part of verse 2, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And he makes this as a definite, emphatic comment, I am not giving up. He is showing persistence, he is showing his uh, spiritual tenacity, and he is being aggressive toward his spiritual life. He is not going to give up, he's not going to fade out because the journey is going to get a little longer. He is going to uh, stay committed to the mission. And so what we are going to see here in this series of tests is that Elijah is or Elisha rather is not going to be dissuaded or distracted by any of the circumstances of the journey. He knows that he has been appointed by God and he's not going to take the responsibilities of his spiritual life or his spiritual gift which in that sense was not like the spiritual gift of the church age, but his gift as being a prophet, lightly. He's not going to treat it lightly. He recognizes that as a believer, he needs to exploit the grace of God in his life to the maximum because he has been saved just as we are for a purpose, and he is going to focus his life and his mission on fulfilling that purpose to the greatest degree. Now, there's all kinds of different spiritual gifts in the church age, all kinds of different ministries that different believers have uh, within the local church and to other members of the local church, and the only way you will maximize your ministry in your own spiritual gift is to grow to spiritual maturity. Now, you don't even have to know what your spiritual gift is, because as you grow to spiritual maturity, you will naturally gravitate to areas of your spiritual life uh, of service. And service is sort of a catch-all spiritual gift because it manifests itself in all kinds of different ways, Uh, whether it's a gift of uh, communication, uh, evangelist or pastor teacher, whether it is a gift related to leadership in a local congregation, gift of of administration or something of that nature, a gift of helps, gift of mercy, gift of service. These are all gifts that are uh, distributed 
in any given congregation. And so our attitude by way of application should be the same as Elisha's, that we're not going to stop. We're not going to reach a point in our spiritual growth and say, well, I'm satisfied. I'm just going to you know, peel off here to this uh, rest area and we'll just wait here till the next one comes along. No, we're going to have to demonstrate the same kind of perseverance and persistence and spiritual tenacity that Elijah, Elisha demonstrated here. Now, Elisha knows that Elijah is about to be promoted to heaven. He's not ignorant of this. And one of the reasons he is so dogged is because he understands this cultural dynamic that went on, that when a person died, they would bestow a blessing on their heirs. Some of you remember when we were studied this in, in the 49th chapter of Genesis, when Jacob or Israel died and he gathered the 12 sons uh, around his bed and announced his blessing to them. And uh, uh, as well as prophecies related to the trends of each one of the tribes that that came from came from them. So Elisha is doing the same thing. He knows that Elijah is going to die, and Elijah, and before he dies, he will bestow a blessing upon uh, his uh, successor. And Elisha does not want to miss out on anything that God has for him. Now, I phrased it that way because that is one of the spiritual traps that Christians often fall into. It is a correct but a rather general statement to say, I don't want to miss out on anything God has for me. But you have to recognize that God doesn't have things for you that he had for other believers in other dispensations. And I have heard Christians down through the years say, oh, well, you know, maybe we ought to, we ought to uh, <clears throat> experiment with uh, the, the gifts of tongues or the gift of healing or some of these other things because we don't want to miss out on something God might have with us. It's sort of a, an experimental spirituality that, that is informed by a lack of doctrine and not by anything else. You know, just a, in ignorance, people say, well, I want to give every opportunity for God to do whatever he might do. And it's a very misguided and naive mistake often made by the uh, spiritually young. And so we have to be very careful not to give in or not to be sucked into that kind of naivete. Um, what we see in Elisha is the fact that he is limiting this to the pursuit of Elijah. He understands the doctrine behind this related to the role of the prophet and the transfer of that responsibility to him. And so he's going to stick with his mentor and his, uh, his, the one who is uh, his leader, his head. Now for us, this, may man- this, this spiritual tenacity... This is going to manifest itself in some different ways. Just uh, generally, there are five things that we ought to emphasize that ought to be present in our life if these character qualities are present. And first of all, it's just regular Scripture reading. Every believer ought to be regularly reading through the Bible, and you ought to be trying to read through the Bible once a year or once every couple of years or twice a year, something like that. And there are different editions of different things through the Bible in a year, different schedules that you can easily find. If you just read uh, five chapters a day, you can easily get through the Bible in a year. And that ought to be something that every believer does every year just so they're reminded of promises. As you read through, uh, highlight promises that you see, maybe jot a question down in the margin and just uh, move on. Uh, but read, you become aware of who's who and what's what and where's where. And so things that I teach and talk about on Sunday morning or in Bible class mean something to you because you develop this uh, general knowledge of the Bible. We live in a culture today that is biblically ignorant. By gosh, if you're just going to read any kind of English literature written before 1950, if you don't know the Bible, you can't understand half of the metaphors and allusions that are in, in literature because they were all written by a biblically informed English culture. And it, doesn't ha- it may not even have anything to do with spirituality. You just don't want to be... Uh, ignorant when you read things or go places where there are these kinds of uh, pictures or imagery. How can you understand what goes on in half the pictures down at the uh, museum 
of a fine art if you don't have some knowledge of who these characters are in the Bible. So you should be reading the Scripture on a regular basis. Second thing you should be doing is you should be memorizing Scripture. Memor- some of those promises that you find when you read through, you ought to underline them and memorize them. Write them out on a three-by-five card. Paste them on the visor in your car and you know, flip it down. And when you're uh, caught in traffic going to work, you can review yourself or uh, anything else. But just to have those there so that you can memorize those promises. Because if the faith rest drill, which is the foundation for the whole spiritual life, functions on claiming promises, if you don't know promises, you can't claim them. It's not about claiming principles. Whenever you see Jesus or Paul or any of the other spiritual leaders in either the Old Testament or the New Testament uh, dealing with a problem in life, they're not saying, well, God, I'm going to claim this principle. You don't see that. What are they doing? They're quoting Scripture. Every time Jesus dealt with the temptation of Satan in the wilderness, he quoted Scripture. It is Scripture that you need to memorize, and that's what you need to claim. And if you know three promises, then your spiritual life is going to be a little limited, isn't it? How many promises can you claim in difficulty? Well, I have three. How far are you going to go? Not far. So we need to be memorizing Scripture. Third thing, you need to be going to Bible class. Now, sometimes you can't get here. I understand that, and that's the value of live streaming. It's the value of having all the different media forms that we have today to uh, store and retrieve all the Bible classes. But that ought to be a priority in your life. And no matter how old you are, that ought to be a priority. Sometimes people say, well, I would come to Bible class on Tuesday and Thursday night if you had something for the kids. You know, everybody with kids that said that would come, then we could have a consistent prep school for kids on Tuesday or Thursday night, and that would work. But since it's sort of a piecemeal fashion, it's rather hard. But I remember when I was a kid that, um, you know, folks would take their kids to Bible class and they would sit there quietly, well-behaved, and uh, listen to Bible class. And that should be the pattern, because as parents, your number one objective should be to train your children to make the Word of God in their spiritual life their number one priority. And that's leading by example. And if they can't see that as your number one priority, how are they ever going to catch that and make that their number one priority? So regular attendance Bible class, put it on your, uh, put it on your iPod, Put it on your iPhone. Figure out how to do that. i got to figure out some of that. Last week when I was at uh, the WHW conference, I had a, uh, a guy come up to, came up to me, and all the classes that I had taught out at WHW since 1998 were all on his iPhone. And he just plugs it into a speaker in his car and listens to, to that whenever he's traveling around. Plus, he gets a number of other things as well. So you have all kinds of ways to expose yourself on a regular basis to be reminded constantly of, of the Word of God. Fourth thing is you need to develop a disciplined and consistent prayer life. A disciplined and consistent prayer life, which means developing a regular prayer time, developing your own personal prayer list, and it also involves being uh, coming together for prayer meeting at church. We have prayer meeting every Tuesday night from 7.30 to 8 o'clock, and there's a faithful handful that show up consistently, but there are so many more that just don't think that's a priority. But it is, and it should be, and you should make that part of your spiritual life. And then the fifth point are the three basic laws of spiritual growth, sort of like the three basic laws in real estate. Application, application, and application. It's amazing to me how many people I have seen over the years who have notebooks filled with doctrine, have stacks of tapes or uh, computers filled with uh, enormous amounts of uh, uh, doctrine on various kinds of media, and yet the first time they hit any kind of speed bump in life, they just fall apart because they've never really internalized and practiced for the tough times. I remember when I was a kid, I hated practicing piano. But every morning at 7.15, I had to be 
in the living room playing the piano, and I had to practice for 30 minutes. We didn't have to be at school till 8.30, so I had to practice for 30 minutes every morning. Because when recital time comes, if you haven't practiced, you will embarrass yourself. And see, that's all those little tests we run into and all those little decisions we make every single day in every single way. If we're not applying the word there, then when the speed bumps come, you're not going to apply it there either, and you're going to just be uh, just a crash on the highway of life and another casualty of the uh, uh, of Christian failure because you just collected everything on notes. And when the speed bump came, you said, well, you know, I got those principles and promises somewhere on my hard drive, but it crashed. So, application. Practice it. Okay. Verse 3. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? Now this represents another kind of test. And this is a test of people who uh, want us to focus on something other than our spiritual life and our spiritual advance. On the map, I have Bethel located there. So they walked from uh, Shechem in the north down to Bethel, which is probably a distance of uh, 50 or 60 miles. And it is there that these sons of the prophets come out. Now, who are the sons of the prophets? This is a group of men who were worked with the prophets, ministered to them, and were uh, prophets themselves, but were being mentored, trained, and apprenticed by, by senior prophets. But notice where the distraction is coming from. The distraction isn't coming from the bad guys. It's coming from the good guys. The, the distraction is coming from these other prophets. Now, you know, isn't this terrible? Elijah's going to go. What are we going to do? They're already pushing the panic button, and they're not focused on the plan of God, that it's always God's plan to take somebody, uh, some leader to be with the Lord. God, in His sovereignty, gives gifts and ministries to individual men, individual leaders, both in Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, for specific objectives. Where did they get the gifts? From God. Where did they get their native talents? From God. Where did they get their distinctiveness? From God. Where did they get their their mission to find? From God. Didn't have anything to do with them. Didn't have anything to do with Elijah. Didn't have anything to do with Elisha. Didn't have anything to do with John or Paul or Peter or Irenaeus or John Calvin or Martin Luther or John Darby or any other leader in Christian history. Everything that these men did was defined by God. It was missioned by God, if I can make that a verb. And it was the gifts and the abilities that they used to accomplish those objectives were given by God. And when they died, God's plan was carrying on because God's plan was for them to pass from the scene and for the next generation to go through the challenges, the tests, and everything else, and to build on that which had, which had gone before. And so these prophets were like so many people who, when some Christian leader dies, think, oh, what are we going to do now? They're gone. Well, same thing we've always done. We're going to study the Word of God, apply the Word of God, and go forward, because God's plan is never limited or restricted or dependent upon the ministry of any human being. Now, the reason they go down to Bethel, or one of the reasons they go down to Bethel, is because of its significance in the history of Israel. Gilgal was significant because it's up there by Shechem, by Mount Gerizim, and Ebal, which is the location by the Oaks of Moriah where Abraham built his first altar to God, and God... uh, made that first clear statement of the land promise in Genesis 12, 7. <clears throat> when Abram left Shechem, left the area of Shechem in Genesis 12, he headed south to Bethel. And there he built his second altar. And this became a primary site. The Canaanite name for the city was Luz, and this became a, another place where God confirmed the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, in Genesis chapter 28, God appeared to Jacob in a dream. This is that dream usually referred to as Jacob's ladder. Literally, it's 
he had a vision of a stairway to heaven and angels ascending and descending. And this was where God confirmed the Abrahamic covenant to Jacob, both when he was headed out of the land for his brief sojourn up with Laban, when, <clears throat> where he picked up his two wives, and then when he returned to the land, again he stopped at Bethel, and God spoke to him uh, there. So they go to Bethel because, again, this is a <clears throat> reminder that this land, this people, have a unique role in God's plan and purposes and the way that they are they communicate with God and God communicates with them is through the prophet the prophet is the representative of God and <clears throat> as part of the ministry of the prophet they had this group called the sons of the prophets and this would indicate that they were also prophets we don't know a whole lot about them. The first time they show up in the Scriptures in 1 Samuel 10, verses 10 to 12, right after Saul is anointed by Samuel to be the uh, first king of Israel, then he comes upon this group of prophets, and Scripture says that he uh, <clears throat> prophesied with the prophets, which I take to mean something related to, to worship with the prophets, and then it's found again in 1 Samuel 19.20, David found refuge as Saul was hunting him. He found refuge among the sons of the prophets. And they're, they're alluded to as the sons of Isaiah in Isaiah 8.18. 8, now this whole, I, this whole dynamic of the sons of the prophets also brings in a, another important dimension, and that is that any leader that is worth the title of leader is preparing and planning for his future departure. He's preparing the next generation of leaders to take his place. Uh, we see this, Elijah's been preparing Elisha, but not only that, there are these other prophets that are being prepared for the future. One mark that I find of leadership that I find lacking in many leaders is they never answer the question, what if it doesn't work? What if there's failure? What if... Pastor Dean drops dead of a heart attack tomorrow. What if this happens? What if that happens? If you don't have a worst-case scenario, then you're not prepared. And I've seen this happen in so many different churches and ministries where all of a sudden the pastor dies or something happens, and they don't have a clue what to do because they've never had good leadership that prepared for any eventuality. There's always got to be a, <clears throat> a training and a preparation and an apprenticeship to prepare for leaders in the coming years. And there's two areas that uh, I would emphasize here as we think about this company of prophets, these sons of the prophets. The first has to do with it's an association that is important for mutual encouragement and edification. Now, I don't mean association in a formal sense like a denomination, but in an informal sense, which is developed through per, uh, friendship, involvement. Today, we would see participation in meetings like the pre-trib conference that meets in December, the Chafer conference, FGA conference, other uh, conferences like this that provide materials for pastors. And a lot of times what <clears throat> pastors benefit from going to those things isn't just the content they learn from the speakers, but just the opportunity to be, spend some time with other pastors who think the same way they do and that they can interact with and learn uh, and get ideas on how to handle different situations, circumstances, things that come up in life and what they're, what they're studying. And different men have different gifts and strengths and specialties, and so there is that, that mutual ministry that, that can occur. So there's that. There's an importance to that. And one of the greatest dangers that a pastor can fall into is the trap of isolation, where they are isolated from other pastors and trends that are going on in their generation and culture, and they don't know what's going on. And today, with the multiplication of so much heresy and error and, and garbage out there, I've ama been amazed at how I've seen a number of pastors over the last 30 years drop by the wayside and fall out or fail in the ministry or get completely distracted by some heretical doctrine because they didn't know who 
who they were reading. They started reading some book by somebody, and they had no clue, usually because they never went to seminary, so they never learned enough to know who's who and what's what and who the players are and what the positions are. And so they get distracted, and they get defeated by some kind of uh, false error because of their own arrogance and isolationism. And that's a terrible thing. That's one of the reasons that we have uh, conferences like that. But another thing that needs to be emphasized is just education. The benefits of going to seminary, not just staying at home and, and um, uh, taking correspondence courses in theology or religion or whatever. I mean, that may be fine if you just want to improve your uh, knowledge of Scripture or your ability to teach in Sunday school, something like that. But if you're going to be a pastor, you need to have the spiritual uh, gumption to trust God and get up and move across the country and go to seminary because you're going to learn all... There's all kinds of things you learn in seminary that are important for training you to be a pastor that don't have anything to do with Greek or Hebrew or theology. It has to do with trusting God to pay your bills, trusting God to provide a job for you, trusting God to find the right place for you to live. And if you don't learn to trust God for those things when you're in seminary, how are you going to learn to trust God for those things when you get out there as a pastor and you have a congregation that you're in charge of? There's other things that you learn in, uh, in seminary that are not measured by anyone's transcript. You learn to communicate with other pastors. You learn respect for those who may not agree with certain positions that you take. You learn to think critically as you talk to somebody who's as knowledgeable as you are and they disagree with you and you they have good reasons for it and you have to go home and say okay I have to really think about what I'm what I'm saying and not just pontificate uh, and express my opinion I've read sem- I've read papers by seminary students at a graduate level that I have given a zero on because all they did was pontificate on their opinions Whether they were right or wrong is irrelevant, but they couldn't express why they believed it or why it was correct. And so that is a failure. You have to learn how to, you have to learn how to think. You have to, um, uh, go through the various academic disciplines of learning to be at class on time, to be at class every day. You need to learn how to manage your time. So when you're taking 15 hours of graduate school and you're working 20 hours a week, you can't do it all. So you have to learn how to properly manage your time. You need to learn how to uh, read fast, assimilate information quickly. You learn how to meet deadlines because Sunday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever the case may be, you have a final three, four, five times a week, and you have to get in that pulpit, and that's your final. You have to move through massive amounts of material, uh, work your way through eight, ten commentaries, the Greek text, the Hebrew text, whatever else, in 10 or 15 hours, and then generate a 45-minute to an hour uh, Bible class. And you learn how to do that by going through the academic discipline, by writing papers and making deadlines, taking exams, developing all those communication skills. Today there's this trend, I mentioned this the other night, about let you stay at home and take online courses. Now let me ask you something. Would you go to a physician who took 12 years to get his online medical degree? but he didn't have what it took to get up and go to a good school and go through the process of getting an education. Would you, if you were in trouble, if you were uh, wrongly charged for a felony, would you go to a lawyer that took 12 or 15 years to take an online course of, uh, on law? Never met with other lawyers, never challenged by a professor to explain his opinions, uh, never put on the spot in front of anybody, and yet uh, you, they would expect you to recognize their their credentials as a, as a lawyer. No, but we have people in pews who do that with pastors all the time. The most important job in the world, the man who is going to communicate doctrine to you. It's a mark of the failure of our generation, and it is as much a damning comment on our generation spiritually as the comment in Judges was that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's what's happening. It's just a result of spiritual relativism. 
Well, in verse 4, we read, Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now, Jericho is important because Jericho was the first place they had a battle, first place where they defeated the Canaanites as they took possession of the land. Land covenant emphasized at at Shechem, at Gilgal, land covenant at Bethel, taking the land at Jericho. So what these three places emphasize spiritually is a recognition that God had given this land to the descendants of Abraham. God had made these promises to Abraham. The Israelites were a special people. The mission that God had given to Elisha and to Elijah as prophets was a divine commission, just like every single believer in the church age has a divine commission in terms of their spiritual gift. They recognized that they had that, and it was their role to fully develop it and use it and to exploit it to the maximum. And we see what is necessary, that that perseverance, that tenacity, to stick with it, to stay there, to to make doctrine the number one priority in your life, but not just the knowledge of doctrine, but the application of doctrine. And that applies to every single uh, believer. Now, we've gotten down almost to the Jordan. We'll complete the journey uh, next week and see how that relates as we finish up the chapter. But the challenge to each of you is, is really twofold. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the challenge is that the God of Elijah and the God of Elisha is the God of grace who gave them their gifts, who gave the gracious promise of land to Israel. And this is the God who has given us the gracious solution to sin at the cross uh, in Jesus Christ, that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, trusting in him. For the bel- Believer, the challenge here is to ask yourself, what's your real priority? And when it's all said and done, and your physical body's in the box and your soul is before God, uh, that's the, the only thing that you're going to take with you. The only thing that's going to be there as any kind of credential for your destiny in heaven is going to be your spiritual growth, your spiritual maturity. You're guaranteed that you'll be there because you trusted in Christ. But we're going to all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for how we use the time, talents, and treasure that God has has given us. And so the challenge to each of us is to have this same kind of spiritual perseverance and persistence that, that Elisha demonstrates. With our heads bowed, and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study these things this morning, to be reminded of who you are and the realities of life, and that we have each been given, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, a a commission to serve you, to serve you faithfully on the basis of the spiritual gifts that you've given us, uh, to serve you within the body of Christ, to serve you in our lives, and in order to exploit that, we have to grow to spiritual maturity, which can only come one way, And that's by studying your word and putting it into application in our lives. Father, we pray that you would challenge each one here with that objective. And also, Father, if there's anyone here this morning that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal life, that you would take this time to make that really clear to them. That if you're unsure and uncertain of your salvation, this is your opportunity to make that sure and certain. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the promise of Scripture that you will be saved. That salvation is for those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he and he alone has solved your problem. He has given you, at salvation, he will give you everything you need to be a success in life. But the issue is your volition, your decision, your will. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Scripture says you will be saved. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge us with the things we've studied this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.